Welcome back. The next company to present is Medivir, and we're joined by CEO Jens Lindberg. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to join us. Um, Medivir is a Swedish listed company market cap around 450 million in sort of mid-stage clinical development for its lead asset um, and also a portfolio of sort of partnered or partnerable assets also primarily within the field of oncology. I'll pass the word over to you, Jens. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so uh, happy to be here and present Medivir today. Uh, if we get right into it, instead of I won't go through this slide, important information is in our presentation, which you will find on our website. So please have a look. Uh, as Adam pointed out, uh, we are standing on, on two legs. There, on the one hand, we do have a unique, what we believe first in class, lead asset in liver cancer, which we are developing ourselves. And that's where we spend the majority of our time, sort of maybe 80% of our time. Then we do have a, uh, an additional sort of portfolio of assets, which we are looking for. So we have a partnering strategy where we're looking to create value uh, by out, out licensing to others. And in the today's presentation, I'll focus on our lead asset, but I'll, I'll touch on the, uh, the other assets, sort of the other products at the end. Uh, so... This is part of a sort of a strategic shift that sort of started back in 2014, 2015, moving from sort of the research in, in, in the virology area into the oncology area, uh, where Medivir's two science platforms of protease inhibitors and polymer acid inhibitors were sort of moved into finding targets and uh, sort of creating benefits for patients in the area of oncology. And this is where our lead asset, which is then Fostroxacitabine bradpamide, which is an in-house developed asset, which we are now in phase 1b, phase 2a. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, as mentioned, so just to give a, a pipeline overview, these are the assets that we have. And as mentioned, I will focus on the top one. Oh, I see the box landed a bit wrongly there, but we'll focus on the top one, which is in development for uh, primary liver cancer uh, as we speak. So if we go into this, and, and before sort of jumping into the details of, of why be, we believe that sort of Fostrox is, uh, is a very exciting asset to take forward, uh, let's just quickly look at liver cancer. Uh, liver cancer is a relatively small market today, but it's also estimated to grow quite drastically over the next uh, 10 years, sort of almost fivefold. Uh, and partly driven by the fact that there is a very large unmet need in liver cancer. Today, we've seen a lot of advancements recently, but still sort of only one third of patients respond to the best approved combination therapies today. So unmet need remains. And keep in mind the combination part, because we believe combinations is, is where the growth will come from, and that's what will be needed to, to drive sort of benefits for patients. And it's an important element in, or an important part of our strategy for Fostrox moving forward. So uh, digging into the molecule, uh, it's a sort of very exciting sort of innovation based on two well-known sort of parts. One, in terms of mechanism of action, if you see on the right-hand side, it's based on an active substance called troxacytabine. It's an old substance. It's been developed in... in in liver cancer and the studies have been run and we know it has anti-tumor efficacy. Problem with troxacytabine and all other chemotherapies in liver cancer is that it's difficult to get the right concentration into the liver without sort of creating a lot of systemic side effects. So that's why across most tumor types you see chemotherapy being the backbone, whereas in liver cancer that's not the case. It's, it's used quite seldom for that reason. And this is where Medivir's sort of knowledge with regards to research in the hepatitis C area sort of came in handy, i.e. the pro-drug technology uh, was, was, was used to get the chemotherapy sort of into the liver while minimizing side effects. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you see the, the, the so-called pro-drug tail, which is then attached to the active substance. And what it does is that it takes, you can, then you can administer it orally, which is a benefit in itself, and it goes through the gastrointestinal tract and it's absorbed in the liver. So we get it local targeted to the liver, enabling then chemotherapy to be used in liver cancer. 
And the other part, uh, if we sort of dig in a bit further, is that uh, while we, on the one hand, we get the chemotherapy or the, the, the active substance into the liver, the other uh, interesting part is that when it's absorbed in the liver, uh, we can see that it kills tumor cells, but it spares normal liver cells because normal liver cells don't proliferate as much and therefore are not as affected by the chemotherapy. So one, we get it to the liver, and two, we kill cancer cells in the liver, but we spare normal liver cells. Uh, I talked about combinations before and why we believe that sort of Fostrox is, is well positioned uh, in the area of, of liver cancer from a combination point of view. And that is, if we look at the current pipeline, uh, there are a lot of development programs in place. Uh, they are, most of them are centered on two areas of mechanism. One on the left hand side, stimulation of the immune system. You have all the PD1, PDL1 inhibitors, etc. On the right hand side, uh, the compounds that block the blood uh, supply to the tumor, the VGF inhibitors, the, the, T the multi kinase inhibitors. Again, roughly the same. So, no matter what compounds you use, there are only so many different sort of variations of combinations you can make here, which is sort of, we believe that there is a, a high value in providing a third bucket. And if we then look at Fostrox and the, the mechanism of Fostrox in relation to the others, there is a good scientific rationale for why it's, uh, why it would be promising to combine Fostrox with either one of the the other mechanism. So on the left hand side, uh, we know from, from other tumor types, lung cancer, etc., that sort of chemotherapy, chemotherapy plus checkpoint inhibitors do add value. And if when you sort of as a chemotherapy, you induce that DNA damage and, and, and cell death, that um, increases the tumor antigen presentation for potential increased immune response. So there's a rationale for why they would work together and you would have an additive effect, why Fostrox would help the checkpoint inhibitors do their job even better. On the other side, uh, with the TKIs, it's a little bit the reverse. Uh, the, the, the TKIs, they block the blood supply to the tumor. That lowers the oxygen. And when you lower the oxygen level in the tumor, that increases the conversion to the active metabolite of, of Fostrox. So in, 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 this time, uh, sort of in this combination, the TKIs will help Fostrox do a better job. But in any case, in either one of the combinations, there is a scientific rationale for why we believe sort of it adds value. And it does add in a third mechanism to combine in the area of liver cancer. <laughs> so looking then at sort of where we are and, and what we've shown so far, sort of last year, at ESMO, we show the, the first uh, monotherapy data. Uh, we had monotherapy data in, in, lost the slide here. Don't know if they're, are they still seeing it on, good. Uh, the first monotherapy data at ESMO, uh, we had, uh, we showed in both uh, primary liver cancer, but we also had patients with liver metastases from colorectal cancer, etc. But what we could see is that it was primary the patients with, with, with HCC or primary liver cancer that sort of showed a response or had a stable disease. So that was sort of encouraging results in showing efficacy and also showing that the safety profile is acceptable. The plan was never to, to take it forward as a mono, but you, you need to sort of start with uh, to, to show that it works as a monotherapy. Uh, the plan is to develop it as a combination, and, and that's where we are today. So if we look at the, the evolution, sort of in 22-23, we're now looking to select the dose for the combination studies and then expand those studies to get sort of the first efficacy data as well in the combination. And the study that is now ongoing uh, you can see on, on the slide here, and uh, there are two arms. Uh, first, there are, two, there are two parts. One is the dose escalation sort of part, where we decide the dose for the combinations, and the second is the expansion part. But we also have two arms. Uh, one arm with Fostrox plus uh, Keytruda, uh, one of the checkpoint inhibitors, and the other arm is Fostrox plus Lenvima, uh, the leading TKI. 
And, uh, and when we've established the dose, and as long as we have a safe and tolerable, to, to, acceptable tolerability, we'll roll over into dose expansion for both combinations. Uh, we're running it in EU and Asia, and, and I'm highlighting that because uh, liver cancer is more common in uh, Asian population due to a higher so, rates of, of hepatitis C and B. So it's important that we also include Asian, Asian patients in the study, and we have roughly 40-45% of centers uh, in that study in, in, in Asia, in the Korean population. The other part to comment on from a study details and objectives is that the world or the treatment algorithm in, in liver cancer has, has evolved over the last year and uh, combination therapy of atezolizumab and bevacizumab has become sort of a standard of care. and. Those patients who have gotten atezolizumab in first line and progressed are also included in the study to, to prepare for the future. So we are now developing sort of as a first step in, 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 in primary liver cancer in combination in that sort of second line, hopefully profit, sort of earlier line setting. Uh, as a next step, if we look forward, considering that it's a unique mechanism of action, it's a class of its own, it's the only liver-targeted medicine, uh, we do see an, an, an opportunity for it to become a sort of a backbone combination to combine with whatever other combination you are you're using, as long as the, the, the data in the combination study shows promise, promise of course. Uh, and then third step is then to look beyond primary liver cancer. We know that colorectal cancer... Patients are, are well treated today many times, but they also, a lot of the patients have, have um, liver metastases and they are difficult to treat. So a local liver targeted uh, chemotherapy could potentially be a benefit for those patients as well. But that will be a step later down the line. So uh, just sort of a, a couple of words on, on, the, on the pipeline. There are a number of assets that we have either out-licensed or we're working to find partners for. We've seen some development in, in the last year as well. Last We did out-license Birina Pant to IGM Biosciences in San Francisco, and they are now running a combination study of Birina Pant plus their own IGM 8444, and they are also in dose escalation mode, and they presented some really exciting preclinical data at AACR this year where they showed sort of really strong synergistic cytotoxicity across multiple solid tumor indications. And they are now dosing up in their dose escalation. So it's roughly the same phase as, as, as Fostrox. So exciting uh, combination there as well in terms of moving forward with benefits for patients. But as I mentioned, our focus in terms of development is primarily on Fostrox, our sort of unique first-in-class potential treatment for liver cancer. And as I mentioned, sort of three things to, to take away today. It's an area of significant unmet need. And considering that we have a unique mechanism of action, we do believe we're not sort of replacing or complementing others. Two, being unique uh, in that it sort of it selectively targets cancer in the liver, we also bypass certain resistance mechanisms for for efficacy. And finally, uh, considering that the mechanism of action is is well established, uh, it does have a strong potential for attractive combinations across both other classes of drugs in development for liver cancer. So with that, I will stop. Great. Thank you very much for, for that presentation, Jens. Uh, a few questions then. Sure. Uh, a first one um, on, on a, potential, uh, a potential pivotal phase 2B study. Yep. Uh, and, and the question is uh, whether you have a sense for what the efficacy bar would be in such a study. Um, and I'm for an accelerated mm. approval, I guess, yeah. specifically. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason I ask then is, is Pembrolizumab and yeah. Ipinibu, when they were approved, mm. they would have had patients who had progressed primarily on serafinib, whereas you in the second line yeah. will see more Tesobev progressors. Yeah. Um, how should we be thinking about what the efficacy bar might be uh, for, for accelerated approval? Well, Tricky question, of course. But. Well, it's difficult to, to, difficult to anticipate. But, mm. I mean, today, uh, as, I, the, the, uh, as I mentioned, sort of, or maybe I did mention, but to put it this way, the, the, the Keytruda or the Ipo Nevi mm. data in second line, mm. sort of on the back of, as you said, Serafinib or... or 
those are populations that will no longer exist mm. because the, so the, they will they're sort of that those approvals are based on on a population that is no longer there mm. so the more relevant is to look at what are you bringing as a single agent tki mm-hmm. lenvatinib serafinib in second line mm-hmm. so that will likely be the comparator mm-hmm. Uh, where they are showing roughly 15, 15, 20% overall response rate. So mm-hmm. do we need to be better? Yes. Mm. So uh, difficult to say, but maybe up up towards those 25, 30% mm. response rate, a little bit what you're seeing in first line. I think mm. then if you land around there, then I think we're, we are, uh, th- then that would be sufficient enough for mm-hmm. accelerated approval, mm. considering that, the unmet need is so big and, and there's a need for additional sort of mechanisms. That, sure. that would be our anticipation today. Okay, okay. No, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then as it relates to being able to uh, secure accelerated approval yeah. with these uh, Pembro and Iponevo yeah. um, likely to be converted into full approvals, yeah. I guess. Um, does that, from a regulatory point of view, does that make it a lot more difficult for you to get an accelerated approval in a second line setting? or? I mean, there is there is regulatory yeah. leeway yeah. in terms of bringing it, something else to the table. Yeah. And so on. A little bit for the reasons I mentioned, we don't think so mm. uh, because of, of them being approved in a population that is no longer the mm. second line mm. population. Mm-hmm. So on the back of a test of BEV, it's mm-hmm. a whole different ball game, mm-hmm. and, and it wouldn't really make any sense if you've had a PD one mm-hmm. in first line. Mm-hmm. That are the the would you go with the PD one in second line? So mm-hmm. you probably need something different. You're mm-hmm. looking for different mechanisms. So. Do we believe that they will be approved on the back of? Yes. Do we think it changes the bar? Mm. No. And mm. going back to the 20, we will still need to show mm. reasonably good data, but mm. sort of in that sort of realm of maybe 25, 30, if mm. I speculate a bit. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, and you went through the the trial design of, mm. of, of the current study yeah. um, and, and you're sort of hedging yourself a bit with, with the combination yeah. uh, with both Envima and, and, and Keytruda um, because of that. Uh, I mean, th- that's one of each from, from yeah. the predominant yeah. drug classes, as you were saying. Um, beyond, beyond those two drug classes, are there, uh, it's a shifting landscape, but are there other um, sort of material pipeline programs to be aware of that could sort of change how you need to think about positioning? Are there other material ones that you're... None that we feel today or would single out. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of, it's a bit too early to say. Mm-hmm. Data will show. Mm-hmm. But I think that's sort of what we what we feel good about, sort mm-hmm. of kind of coming back to the point is that being quite different, mm-hmm. being a bit unique in that sort of liver targeted approach, mm-hmm. chemotherapy locally, which we know it works. Mm-hmm. We, we sort of, when we look at the landscape, we feel that, yeah, you know, whatever targets come out and look good, mm. there there will likely be a benefit or a rationale for combining with with our mechanism, mm. which is quite different and quite unique. So mm-hmm. as long as sort of as long as we're good enough mm-hmm. in, in, in in our combinations, mm. then I'm less worried. Mm-hmm. If we are not good enough in our combinations, mm. then we have a bigger problem. So future no, I only mm-hmm. said the, the more, the merrier, the, mm-hmm. the, the better for patients mm-hmm. and the more combinations we can provide mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. That would be our sort of general sort of feel today. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. okay, no, that's helpful. Um, and then on, uh, you just mentioned that this sort of um, um, liver specific or liver targeted mm-hmm. uh, mechanism, um, can you uh, just clarify sort of where, how does that come about or what what is it? It's not something that's you know specifically liver targeted, but it is to do with the uptake being uh, primarily. Yeah. Uh, so when in the you liver. when you attach the pro drug to the <laughs> active substance and you you sort of you in, sort of in, take it in orally, it goes through the gastrointestinal tract without mm. being absorbed, and then it's absorbed. It, it's sort of into the liver, mm. and there when you get into the liver, it's the, the pro drug tail is cleaved off. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in order to, and then that that generates a a cascade of of Sort of uh, go from from monophosphate to 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 to, to, to all the way to triple phosphate mm-hmm. to to generate the act- active metabolite. Mm-hmm. So it sort of kind of goes. Uh, it's like taking a fast taxi to where it needs to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas if you give it sort of IV, mm-hmm. then you reach a systemic effect. Sure. Alrighty. Um, and perhaps a, a final question then on on um, cash and cash runway. Yeah. Um, you've got a one where they should you see you through the, yeah. the, the current study. Yes. Um, how um, 
how how much further beyond that and how are you thinking in terms of um, uh, kind of trial costs or so? How much funding do you need for, for a subsequent uh, phase to be study in terms of how large it needs to be and, and, and so on? Is it? I think I, I will refrain from giving any numbers on it mm -hmm. because again, it will it will depend on the data mm -hmm. in that second line in the 2A space mm -hmm. and, and what will the design then need to be from a, from a size, etc. Mm -hmm. Clearly, mm -hmm. it will be more sizable than, than, than the one we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, we are funded through the current uh, phase. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the, the one thing, the, the only thing that could be worth possibly commenting mm -hmm. is that, well, if that data looks good, it's mm -hmm. an open label study, if we start to see it, mm -hmm. and we choose a, uh, a, choose a dose and we see that this looks really promising, mm -hmm. then there might be an opportunity to, sort of you might want to accelerate some of the activity for phase 2B, mm -hmm. usually some of the CMC costs. So, mm -hmm. so then there might be a question of, mm -hmm. okay, well, would there be a benefit mm -hmm. with some additional sort of funding mm. ahead of that phase to be mm -hmm. in order to accelerate mm. momentum? Mm. Th I mean, that's a, that could be a question that comes up, mm. uh, but it also depends on, on what's the promise of the data in, in 1B2A. Mm. And then when we see that, then we can make a decision on it. But mm. clearly, if it looks good, mm. we want to minimize the time lag between 2A and 2B. Sure. Okay, alrighty. I think uh, in the interest of time, then we'll we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation and uh, interesting Q and A. Thank you, Alan.